Thanks for joining us. I'm Guy McPherson of the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel. I'm here with Peter Miller, psychologist, once again. And I had an idea and that doesn't happen very often, so I'm going to share it with all of you. <laughs> I'd like Peter to walk us through the three key ingredients that were essential for him to conquer borderline personality disorder, which we'll generally refer to, refer to as BPD because people in the society will do almost anything to prevent saying more syllables. Mm -hmm. So borderline person personality disorder. And on the first page of Peter's website, freebpdcourse.com, he mentions mm -hmm. a structure and set of habits, being determined and following through, and seeking and receiving regular feedback on your actions. So I'd like Peter to walk us through the those three key ingredients of borderline personality disorder and how to overcome borderline personality disorder. And because sometimes I'm not very polite, I will interrupt periodically to ask a question or indicate indicate the connection between what Peter is pointing out and accepting the evidence regarding <laughs> abrupt irreversible climate change. So thanks again for joining Peter, and why don't you take off with whatever I just said? For sure. Um, so yeah, I've been just pondering this a little bit more, um, and those are indeed the, the the keys, I guess, that I, I discovered along the way um, as I was working through BPD and, and learning how to do it. Um, I guess I can't emphasize enough the learning how to do it, and the, the other part is to to get the strength that you need. Um, I don't think you can just sort of, you can't just willpower your way out of any mental health issue and especially BPD. Like you need to have the right knowledge, the right skills, the right approaches, the right techniques. Like it's not, it's like, like you can't just willpower a house to be made. You need to have <laughs> the right, you know, elements, right? In order to do it. Um, and I guess the same could be said for like, I was going to mention what I'm trying to do with my physical health. Like, um, it's not just like I can just willpower my my weight to go down, right? I I need to like get into some new habits and um, and do some exercises, which I got to say I don't enjoy that much. But <laughs> but like and and the weight's starting to come down slowly but surely. But it is a matter of uh, I think doing the work in a way that works. Um, and that's sort of like what the website and my course, I think, is trying to say, like, or offer. Like, here is a way that works to get out of um, the BPD hell or BPD trap um, or the pattern that you're stuck in. So you need to be exposed to the right teachers. And um, so I introduced some of those in the course, like uh, Aaron Beck and Marshall Linehan and several other professionals are in there saying the right things at the right time as you're going through it and so you know getting into um the right um like thought journal or chain analysis exercises um getting expanding your emotional vocabulary uh doing some daily meditation so these are this requires time and effort uh and very it's very um purposeful can, so can i can i interrupt yeah Okay, you, you you talked about um, going to the medical doctor and and being having pointed out that you have these certain behaviors, right? That that like me, for example, I'm overweight. My dad used to say every time he'd go to the doctor, the doctor would say the same thing: you got to eat less and exercise more. That's it; it's <laughs> going to solve ninety percent of your problems. And mm. I suspect that's true, but that's hard, you know. That's that's yeah. why that's, that's why all of this living thing is so difficult is because doing it right is difficult. It it is, and I think that's the part where you know people often get discouraged. They're like, "It's going to be you mean I'm gonna I'm not going to be able to be on my phone as much as I was, or I'm going to have to sweat a bit, or I'm going to be uncomfortable in ways like I'm going to have to change my routine." Like in, in psychology, I, I, it often goes well up until the point where you tell, you know, you're making some offerings or suggestions like, you know, you could try this or you could try that. And 
like but i so i think uh, people kind of get the idea all i got to do is go to the office and have some chats <laughs> right because change is bad we all know change is bad right at least when it comes to our own life or or we have some assumptions that people will fix it for us right That's, oh yeah like so like if you go to the doctor and they talk to you and then they give you a prescription they're sort of fixing it for you all you have to do is take this pill right um like in and in psychology it's it's a lot different like you know, you have to muster the the motivation to change a lot of habits and to get into some exercises and then slowly but surely you start to develop the strength the strength that you need in order to like bring yourself out of the hole or into a new reality into a new a new experience um, where you're not getting stuck in the same old patterns the same old traps and having the same old experiences with people that are not pleasant um, so that's the first part. The second part is, it's the determination, which is another challenge because, um, because believe it or not, even though if you put in the work and the effort, you're going to, you're going to slip, you're going to, you're going to have, um, moments where you go, you revert to the old ways. Well, also let's be honest. Some people do all the right things their entire lives and they still end up being born in the wrong in the wrong place at the wrong time right so for some people there's nothing they can you know probably the the wisest decisions i ever made were being born when and where i was mm -hmm. yeah quite fortunate i guess right, right? more absolutely i'm mm -hmm. i mean i was i was born in 1960 we were experience, still experiencing massive economic growth we weren't in a world war or maybe we were we were and it was just well hidden so that people didn't understand it and it was it was the time to be born really we we are fortunate in many ways i think uh, when it comes to mental health we are still severely shortchanged um like everybody else i guess right like um, because i didn't learn anything about mental health in my whole childhood um i I was taken to a therapist, I think, once or twice. I can't remember for the issue for what. But anyway, I didn't have the greatest experience with that person, and I didn't learn much. And so I just went on with my regular life, uh, which meant right. just learning what everybody else learns. And probably when you were a kid, as when with me, when I was a kid, if if anybody heard that somebody was going to a counselor or a therapist you just assume the worst you don't want to be around that person anymore oh it, can, it must be crazy right it can there can be uh there can be that um yeah the labeling and the stigmatization i was going to say uh, that happens if people are aware i guess you know counselors try and keep it subtle and discreet but it doesn't always work right um so yeah being determined uh so you even when you feel the 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 regret and the shame like if i had a, another bpd episode where i lost control of my emotions and said did things i regret like those are some of the hardest times for anybody with bpd because it's you feel you feel so strongly in the and just in your as who you are from your genetics so you feel everything like times 10 right so if you're going to feel shame you're going to feel it huge um and and after making an effort and then backsliding and being embarrassed by what you said and did it's like it's it's that's where some people sometimes take their life because the shame is so so heavy right um and so that's another thing to have to push through using the same skills that you're learning from the course right so you use the same emotion regulation skills and the same thought challenges to push through that situation um, but it, it, it fucking sucks. It's really hard. Um, well, so I just, also, I want to validate anybody out there listening who has this. And, and also so many people have been so fully indoctrinated with regard to a religion that they think if they die, that they're going to a better place. There, there's no, evidence, there. there's no evidence to support that idea. There's no evidence nope. to support the, the idea that we have more than this. More than no. this one short life on this planet. 
right? Well, sometimes sometimes people use emotional reasoning as evidence for religion, which I, I find quite repulsive. They'll say, well, I feel that it's real and I feel that it's true. So therefore it is. And um, I'm like, I'm like, sorry, that's another one of the cognitive distortions that we get stuck in. It's called emotional reasoning. And you can't use that as a, as a way to support your, what you're doing because we fall into that irrational framework regularly. And, um, uh, and yeah. I have to take issue with that phrase, emotional reasoning. Mm -hmm. If you're using emotions to reason, then you aren't reasoning, right? Well, you're, cer you're certainly not being scientific. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're saying a feeling is a fact, right? And sometimes people say, well, I had this thought, so it's a fact too. Right. Well, right. sorry, it's just a thought. It's, um, you know, it's not, it hasn't been scrutinized. You haven't really, you haven't thought about that thought, right? Yeah, I've, we've all met a lot of people who, who never had a thought that their mouth couldn't use. <laughs> Some of those I'm, thoughts should just stay there inside I've, your own head. I've been that way too. Like when I didn't have any awareness of myself, right? I was very impulsive and the impulsivity is huge with BPD, right? So you you mean you say things that make your life worse and you make your relationships worse. You don't you don't really mean it, which is the crappy part, right? Because you you want good, you want you want to have a good life and good relationships, but your patterns fuck it all up. So it's it's really sad that way. And um and people will sometimes make fun of it. Like they're like, like, look how much you're shooting yourself in the foot, look how you're ruining your own life. Like, and like, look how stupid this is. Like it's like as if you didn't know already. Right. Well, like, like, well, I mean, after the outcomes happen, it's obvious to everybody, right? But in the moment, you can't, you can't, you're not realizing what's happening. Right. So I often say to people, like, one of the things, one of the milestones you want to reach is where you can say, I'm aware of what's happening in the moment. Like, I'm, I can see what thoughts are arising. I can see the emotions that are showing up. So I can see what's happening when it's happening. That's sort of a, a place you can get to eventually when you develop the strength of self-awareness through meditation, right? Like after a period of time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I encourage everybody I talk to, BPD or not, to practice something that helps with self-awareness. And, mm -hmm. and meditation is a good one. Uh, so I, then... I have, I have to comment on that. This, mm -hmm. this idea of self-awareness, of being self-aware. When I was on the University of Arizona campus, there was a student who had this parrot this parrot had been parrots lived for a very long time and they're they're really very intelligent and they were going to conduct this experiment to see if this parrot was self-aware and the one of the ways to find to do that is to have them look in the mirror and distinguish between them and and somebody or something else right so this undergraduate student was working in the lab with this parrot he goes into the bathroom and says oh Look at the parrot in the mirror. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you ruined it. You can no longer <laughs> conduct that experiment because right. now the parrot had been told that that it that it's that that's right. it. Right. right. It, so it so you'll never be able to conduct the experiment to determine whether it's self-aware because it's smart enough that you already told it. I have to try another parrot. Get right. <laughs> right. <laughs> So yeah, so so with that parrot, yeah, it's messed up. Um, but I, gosh, like if there's anything you want to try and um, ascend to, is like uh, self awareness. Um, like uh, Carl Carl Jung said, that was one of the main things driving humans to destruction is the lack of awareness. Like it's our it's our unconsciousness, our auto autopilotness, right? Like that 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 drives a lot of our um, destructive. Dis decision making decision making right like, and 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 by the way carl jung knew that we were headed for extinction at our own hand as as you can oh. read in his later writings really yeah cool. it's, it's pretty amazing you know wouldn't so, surprise me no it wouldn't surprise me um, of course he's a brilliant he was a brilliant man and had self-awareness down and he could see what was going on around him yeah makes perfect mm -hmm, sense mm -hmm. but only in retrospect <laughs> yeah well, and the thing with sometimes um, uh, great thinkers and researchers and the things that they find is they're often disregarded, um, largely. I mean, he is regarded, I guess, one is one of the godfathers of psychology. But how often do people really take seriously his thoughts, right? Like, 
Right. Absolutely. It, so. You know, it doesn't come up in dinnertime conversation ever, right? No. No, not, not People are talking about a thousand other things that are completely irrelevant to their lives. Yeah, but it's only about... it's only us misfits and weirdos that bring up that weird <laughs> shit. Yes. What about Carl Jung? Have you guys no? <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, and the other big piece I said here, number three, was that <clears throat> like you need sort of a go-to source to get some feedback from what you're learning, right? So someone can give you some objective feedback. Because I guess sometimes we can be overly, we can be overly negative or overly positive about how we're doing, like you know, giving ourselves too much credit or not enough. Um, so, so do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody who you go to on a regular basis? I did for a period of time. You know, it was one of my one of my coworkers that I had. I had like probably hundreds of informal mentoring sessions, right? And and I'm just I just I can't believe how lucky I was to have that because it. It literally helped me. It put me on a, a path where I could develop the strength and get the wisdom to do it. Um, so having something like that, I said it could be like an online group or a friend or a therapist or I mean, I think I think even AI can offer some interesting insights if you ask it the right questions. It's not personable like a person, but um, but yeah, you kind of need to get the feedback and it helps you put things into perspective and be more objective. Um, while you're doing that and I don't know some encouragement is kind of nice as well you know right and I and I suspect anybody who is going to be serious about providing feedback is is taking your life seriously right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they won't be that person that is constantly criticizing and not pointing out it in the ways that you can improve and by the way I didn't enjoy all the feedbacks I mean this person <laughs> This person, while very caring, could also be very frank, uh, yes. which I was just, I felt, I felt gutted sometimes, like some of the things, like, I'm like, I still got to work on that. Okay. Yeah. You know, so. Right. Right. So it makes me wonder, the people named Frank, do they have it built in that they're going to be that way? <laughs> well, this person wasn't named Frank. It was, a, <laughs> but definitely had that characteristic. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a Dutch person, so. I guess Dutch Dutch people can be very frank. <laughs> as yeah, far as I, my experience tells me, anyway. Right. I had this. I had this great event. Was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday morning, and carried on into the afternoon. These people looked like they were all college age, or maybe a little older. They're in Dusseldorf. They're calling from Dusseldorf, and they put together this symposium um, about the end of the world, for lack of a better phrase. So they got a Jehovah's Witness on there to chat with them. They got me on there because somebody in the group was familiar with my work. It was such fun. It was great. They're just there's maybe a dozen of these people. They're in their twenties, maybe early thirties. They're all smoking and drinking and carrying on like kids their age do, and asking me great questions, and not not arguing with me, just wanting to know what this means for them. Nice. So so they gave me an opportunity to present the evidence right up front, and then and they didn't question it at all. And they're just like, okay, so how do I, what do I do going forward? You know, this is my life and I only got one short life. And so it was great. It was a wonderful conversation. And it reminded me that on, on the rare occasion now that I, I am given the opportunity to act as a mentor, that that's a serious advantage that that is an enormous privilege that I get mm -hmm. to have that experience. Yeah, it's very meaningful, I think, to be a, a helper in that way with someone who's eager and interested. You know, uh, like I said, I, my my favorite people to meet with are the young, the young early twenties people who have an interest in mental health, like, and they're they're genuinely interested. They're not just coming in just to get somebody off their back or to right or to um, whatever, meet some other requirement. Like they actually want to learn. And these and are the people who could, who could actually, you know, they could change, they could make it, they could change, have a lot of influence. So. Right. And you, and you can tell, 
who's in that category and who's not. You can tell who's taking it seriously. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and, oh, and sure. who just got sent there by their parents or whatever. Oh yeah. No, no, they're a rare, a rare type. I probably have only probably on both hands. I couldn't count in 10, mm -hmm. in 10, 12 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, you keep saying 12 years, but we've been meeting for four months. So oh. more than <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> My practice is 12 years. Yeah. We've been meeting for, <laughs> we've been meeting for about five on and off. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like um, and so probably the more challenging part is where people have a hard time accepting uh the evidence. And you were gonna speak to that, right, as well. And um how we how I, we could compare it to, I guess, where people have a hard time accepting some of the ways that psychology offers to be healthy. Right. Um, well <laughs> evidence is hard to take in, especially when <clears throat> it points to a to a bad outcome but there's lots of examples you know people go skydiving despite the fact that once in every ten thousand times the chute doesn't open or whatever so there's bad news out there something something really interesting happened within the last couple of days taylor swift the musician the singer canceled her second show in rio de janeiro she had this the first show and she canceled it because a young fan died in the first show. Why? It was 137 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 58 degrees Celsius. Wow. In the spring. It's spring. It's not even summer yet. And, and so it made me wonder, do the parents have a responsibility when it comes to sending or, or allowing or encouraging their kids to go to shows like this? when it's mm -hmm. brutally hot it's pretty interesting because taylor swift and her team don't allow anybody in the show carrying water or food mm, bizarre but you can buy water from them for two bucks oh you can't come in right oh yeah you gotta pay the high price okay yeah but that, it's a hundred it's not really hot it's yeah. 58 degrees celsius and you right. can't carry water Right. Are you kidding me? I'm not surprised yeah. somebody died. So yeah. not only does it make me wonder about parental responsibility and or or at least providing a suggestion that maybe you, you ought not go. Taylor Swift, I've I've seen a couple of interviews of hers. I'm not proud of it. It just sort of happened to me. <laughs> and she never accepts responsibility for anything. It's all about her team, right? She never says I. She never says me. She always says us. And <laughs> she's the one making the billions of dollars. It's not her producer or the the gaffer or the guy who handles the sound system who's responsible for that young fan of hers dying in that show. That's on her. Yeah, like it or not, she can. She carried on this show when it's fifty eight degrees. Actually, more than fifty-eight degrees C. Wow. Uh, uh, and I mean, I was going to say it sounds. I was thinking when you know, when you're in a certain type of, I guess, capitalistic paradigm where the capitalist pressure is on, whatever. So the show must go on. I think there's the the level of conscious conscientiousness goes probably goes down a fair degree, right? Um, I guess when there's certain certain things at stake or certain people invested, um, right? And and there's a lot of I mean Taylor Swift has a lot writing on this, right? You know these are the live shows where she became a billionaire, right? And uh, I guess yeah, I mean so many arguments could be made about you know why these decisions are made, and I mean I'm thinking in Canada like if it goes below a certain amount, like where it gets cold enough, they they cancel school, right? Or the buses, or they say, you know, construction workers can't work outside if it's more than minus 25 or something. Of, right? of course. I remember when my dad was principal of school and it was 52 below zero Fahrenheit. So that's, uh, let's see, 40 is the crossover point. So that's about 48 degrees below zero Celsius. So that's pretty cold. Yeah really bad and and 
And my dad walked to school. We only lived a few blocks away. So he walked to school just on the off chance that the radio announcements and common sense didn't get through to anybody or somebody just to make sure that nobody showed up. And sure enough, a little girl walked to school. Wow. It is brutal cold, so he walked her back to her house. The reason I bring this up is I don't think Taylor Swift is going to do anything like that for any of us. I don't think any person with real money is going to take responsibility in that sort of way. It would be nice if they would be an example. I mean, I think she could afford it. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, she could be like, OK, like it's it's too hot. We're not going to do this show. It's, I'm putting your health at risk. Um, and so that's why I mean, she could stand up and say that and still be rich. And she might even get richer because people would be like, oh, you care about my health. like Right, maybe. exactly. Um, like she could. Um, and She she could have easy. a whole new line of T-shirts. You know, <laughs> Taylor Swift cares about me. You wear these things, right? And she could. I mean, and it could be even, yeah, it could be even profitable if you want to look at it that way. Um, so that would be the sad, sick way to look at it. But yeah, I mean, uh she's she could definitely afford it um well and, but it kind of i mean i was thinking too there's conscientiousness at the at the individual level and then the group level and then the society right like like there's i mean and when 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 big bucks get involved i think it all kind of gets warped and distorted and people aren't they aren't thinking clearly absolutely things, you know? absolutely so you're a parent and i'm not and so what do you think about that what do you think about i mean I realize that at some point your kids are old enough to make their own decisions. Yeah. Right. Maybe when they're 18 years old, they're not old enough to, to drink alcohol, but they're old enough to go to the army, at least in this country. They're old enough to shoot people. They're just not old enough to drink alcohol. And is there any parental responsibility? So, you know, it's going to be 58 degrees Celsius in the springtime. And so do you encourage do you just say, no, you're not going to go or I'm not going to feed you again or I'm not going to send you to college? Or I would certainly have the discussion. Like, I mean, I would certainly say these are some red flags. Hello, that you know, that I'm seeing that could be dangerous. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I, I think my way of parenting would be to just kind of keep kind of pointing them out and kind of like being it would be like a bit of a. Uh, what do you call that negative reinforcement? I'll just keep nagging you <laughs> until you, <laughs> until you, until you make a, make the choice that I want, you know, like where I'll just, I just won't relent. I'll, you know, like you might, you might, this might happen, that might happen and it doesn't look good. And um, I think if, yeah, if a parent has, if their if their natural instincts are online and then they have a, a conscience, like they would actually try and fight for their kid's survival. Right. And they would pay attention to some of the variables and the details <laughs> like uh I, I i i i hope that i've been one of those i think for the most part at least the combination of myself and partner yeah mm -hmm. sure i can i can't i guess i can't stay on top of every detail but um well i'm, I'm pretty i'm pretty I'm, I'm pretty vigilant well and that's <laughs> the point of college isn't it is to ensure that parents can't keep track of every detail it's <laughs> wild at some point yeah, and that's the thing too. Like, I guess they at, at a certain point they will decide whatever they want to decide, regardless of what I say. Like, and you know, sometimes people think, "Oh, you're a psychologist. Your kids must like have every tool in the in the tool pack." Like, no, they don't, uh, <laughs> because like I could suggest all I want and I could point things out, and they could just say, "You're crazy. I'm not doing what you know." Like, right. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Or there's you just can that. Give, <laughs> you can give them the toolkit, but that does not guarantee that they're not going to dump out the tools and leave. <laughs> in the woods and, and no. put cocaine in their tool, toolbox no 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 like all the best intentions and knowledge and wisdom sometimes make no difference which kind of sucks um, um so yeah especially with matters of health a person has to want to do it on their for their own reasons i guess that's how humans are we don't just do it because others suggest it's a good idea right it has to be we have to get to the point where it's like i want to do this for me it's not because i'm doing it for dad or mom or my friends or Right. Whoever. Yeah. Right. At some point, at some point, you become old enough. I don't know if you become wise enough, but you become old enough that the law says you're, you're, you have to make these decisions on your own. In yeah. your experience, does that vary? 
a lot or a little for different children of yours? Like some of them are mature mm -hmm. when they're 12 and others are not mature when they're 30, that sort of thing. I think some personalities are more open to suggestion than others. Some are more oppositional, defiant. <laughs> and those are the ones I guess have to learn the harder, the hardest way. <laughs> like uh, my dad gave me lots of good advice that I didn't listen to, uh, especially on like about saving money and stuff. I never listened to anybody. Yeah, um, one of my one of my partner's kids has oppositional defiance disorder, and oh man, it's a struggle. Yeah, so those can be some of the more, I guess, that's the more challenging type of personality to work with. Because I mean, they, they I mean, be... it's a struggle for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has its it, it has its upsides too, because you don't you don't then you don't just go with along with whatever everyone says, right? So right. there's there's good things to being a bit ODD, uh, but sometimes it can be detrimental <laughs> if uh, you're especially yeah if you're trying to deal with a health issue um right but yeah but isn't there an element of that in pretty much every emotional or mental disorder i mean I, i'm ocd and yeah. it's obvious to anybody who spends more than five minutes with me and one of the consequences is i became a professor at a young age yeah because i could focus I still can't focus on specific topics to the point of pretty much excluding everything else and and becoming seriously mentally problematic <laughs> as a result. <laughs> but it had its payoffs, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the ability to focus is actually uh, that can be helpful too. But it, it, it yeah, it comes with consequences. Um, I don't know if you can accomplish anything big or great if if you don't do that. Like you almost have to be unbalanced for a short time. Like if you're going to, like if I'm going to finish recording a song and doing all the finishing touches, like I have to ignore other things for a while, right? And and that comes with consequences. Right. <laughs> I just hope those consequences aren't too great. So right. like, I, I'm uh, I'm classic for being unbalanced. Yeah, that way. Right, right. So we all have other people in our lives and occasionally we have to put those people on hold, as it were. Because we need to do things to ensure our own mental health and yeah. our own success, however we define that. Yeah, life balance is one of the hardest things. I was, I was thinking about it the other day. I'm like, there's so many balls that we juggle, like like with like like with like our health and with work and with family and you know and 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 hobbies and and friendships and you know uh, and and so many various other activities like how do we hold it all together it's almost like it seems like impossible <laughs> so, uh, when i was teaching it, on campus i used to use juggling as an example and and the world has become more complicated in natural resources and ecology and every other way that i can think of anyway so i would take some juggling balls in and i said it used to be we just had this one ball to juggle right we in 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 forestry we just had to grow trees that's it that's all people wanted mm -hmm. that's all people expected of us and then eventually it became about growing trees while protecting the water supply so now we're juggling tool balls and the students to say yeah but can you do it and juggle three and i'm like as if you can <laughs> yes here it goes like this and i actually learned to juggle four balls which is really hard cool. just for that just for that two minute lesson in the class, <laughs> right and, and yes, life is hard. We're constantly, all of us, juggling a whole bunch of different factors, many of which are beyond our control. But mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Yeah. Right? You, you keep on living and, <laughs> and trying to do the right thing, or you do something ridiculous. <laughs> well, things have probably became a lot overcomplicated living in an industrialized society, right? Like, and trying oh, yeah. to keep up keep up with so many important things right like <laughs> that we think are important but they don't maybe they don't matter that much right um so yeah we i i wanted to make sure we threw in there how people kind of get embedded in the system and they become a believer in, in the system and how we can get entrenched in patterns and beliefs and we can we can fight for things that don't serve our interests uh because I mean, I see this all the time in psychology. I saw it in myself. Like I would fight for ideas and beliefs that were doing me no good. They were self-defeating, right? 
Uh, and that's something you can learn a lot about in the course as well, because each person can have a unique way of being self-defeating <laughs> and believing in things that are harmful. Like it, it, it amazes me when I think of like the people in my life and how they're so they're so agreeable to to the industrial way. Like they're so like there's they're they're an advocate even like you know and almost like it's the only possible way well yes when it's all you've ever known and things just keep getting better right you it used to be you had to stand by the phone and and dial it and so it'll take five minutes to dial somebody with a with too many nines in their number and and <laughs> And now we have all these unbelievable privileges that we only could have imagined. For example, when I was a kid, I thought someday, not only are we going, are we going to have flying cars, and that part didn't really work out, but we're also going to have telephones where you can see the other person and talk to them, and it'll be free. And here we are. Yeah, yeah. And that's happening right yeah. now. It's incredible. And so, well, I mean, it has been amazing in ways, um, but I mean, if you if you're going to look at both sides of the coin, I'll let you continue for now. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. There no, that's what I was. That's just what I was going to say. There are costs involved, and it's in. It just amazes me how people can be ignorant or um, ignore certain facts. Like, and I guess that's what I think that's what your work is a lot about, right? You're trying to say, look, these are all the facts you're ignoring while you're so caught up in this, right? Like. In, Right. Like you're not you're not recognizing that there's upsides and downsides to this. And you're you might even be rationalizing the downsides, like saying they're a good thing. You know, like people say, no, carbon is a good thing. It's good if, if we can we can't get enough of it because it's good for the trees. Right. Like that's one of the arguments, right? Somebody sent me an email message right before we started this conversation. And it was about <laughs> some person, I can't even remember who, but he's reasonably well known, who is not only a climate denier, but he goes the other way and says exactly what you just said. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is good. Look at what they do in greenhouses. They pump carbon dioxide in there so that that's not a limiting factor for plant growth. And all these, a million other things this person is relatively famous for. And I'm like, no, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> We're going back to not square one. We're going back to square zero. We're going into negative numbers. I mean, so this person wanted me to make a video about this. And I'm like, I can't do that. People might people might actually believe that I'm taking him seriously. <laughs> I, I I can't I can't give people the impression <laughs> that I'm taking this person seriously. Well, and you explained it to me once because I brought it forth in a video from days old, like uh years old. Like uh I asked that very question to you, and I you told me it was about the balance of gases in the atmosphere and uh, that that is you mean we need a certain amount of carbon but it, it it's way too much is the thing right right um um and so yeah i mean and which makes sense to me when we're talking about life balance and organisms needing to be balanced i mean we're throwing this organism way out of balance and we're you know there's consequences to this like how could there not be consequences if it's a living organism like yes there's going to be consequences and so this is what people do when they're fighting for their beliefs, right? They they will um, it just flat out ignore certain things or find ways to rationalize um, or downplay certain things about, you know, what the pattern that they're in. Um, and it's, yeah, it's actually really, it's strange because in psychology, people fight for their beliefs because I, I think it's because it gives them a sense of safety and security. So even if it's hurting me, I, I still really like it because it gives me a sense of right. safety and security. Because I got to do it for myself. Yeah. Right? Or there's some feel-good element, right? Like, um, Sure. Uh, and so yeah. even if they're doing something that's harmful to themselves, they are in charge. They're the ones who are getting to make the decision. And, they, you know, people can convince themselves of almost, almost anything. You know, shoot, mm -hmm. shooting up cocaine, that must be good for me because I see famous people do it. Those are wealthy people. If it works for them, it's going to work for me. Or, yeah, it enhances my personality for in certain ways and it gets me certain results and outcomes. So right. it's good, right? Like, yeah. So you can be you can be largely led or misguided um, by your experiences like that. And 
So people who are climate deniers or that would be fighting your message, they must be, I mean, I would say they would be stuck in a certain type of belief framework where they're ignoring certain things. Like, um, do, would you, do you, if, has anyone ever asked you if, if you ignore certain things about, or do you think you've looked at the whole big picture? Oh, people ask me that all the time. No, almost nobody asks me. They tell me. <laughs> they tell me what I'm ignoring. They tell me what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. It happens all the time. You know, and, and so there again, there's that balance with who am I going to believe? So I try to identify what qualifies as evidence and then pursue that evidence. And sometimes that's mm -hmm. easier said than done, you know, and that's where emotions come into play and can can mm -hmm. send us down the wrong path. You yeah, know, and you've been you've been accused of cherry picking evidence too, right? Where you say, "Well, this evidence fits my framework, and that evidence fits, so I'm going to use the ones that fit, and I'll ignore the ones that don't." Absolutely. In fact, quite a long time ago, I did an article called "Picking Cherries" or something like that on on my blog, GuideMeFirst.com, and and I pointed out that I'm picking the cherries nobody else is picking. <laughs> Right. Everybody else is ignoring these cherries and they're just going to rot on the tree and nobody wants that mm -hmm. or something like that. It was a long time ago, so I don't really remember. But like one of my professors always said, OK, Peter, you have to find if something that fits your hypothesis and then you have to find the articles that don't. And then you mm -hmm. need to try and put it. You need to try and do a synthesis. And so I would come out in the end, usually more confused because <laughs> like. I'd be trying to make sense of opposing ideas, right? Like, and kind of say, well, we just don't know yet about this because right. there's these opposing ideas. So we just can't know yet. So, so I don't know how you land anywhere. Well, like if you Karl Popper was an amazing scientist and philosopher and in, in the Popperian way, which is named after him, is we can only discount. We can only point out what is wrong we cannot point out what is right. And through a process of eliminating all those things that are incorrect, we can reach a tentative correct answer that's always subject to being proven wrong because that's the goal is to prove as much as possible to be incorrect. And that will lead you, in theory anyway, to what is correct, right? And so he became well known for that. This goes back to the, early 1960s as i recall mm -hmm. and so it makes sense that science proceeds not by well technology proceeds primarily through discovery science proceeds primarily by discounting what isn't true and that leads us to what finally remains which must be true and are we at that point with the climate science do you think or are we at oh. the point where like you know like nobody really knows everybody could be right and we are absolutely, you know, there's a group called the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases that was the predecessor to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was created during the Reagan administration in the United States. And so at the Environmental Defense Fund blog, there's a piece called How the IPCC Got Started. And it was written by Michael Oppenheimer, a ren renowned professor at Princeton University. And he points out that the IPCC was created specifically to fail. And yet, and yet, get this, the IPCC in two separate reports, the October 8th, 2018 report, Global Warming of One and a Half Degrees, and then less than a year later, the IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere and Changing Climate, the IPCC concluded that we are in the midst of abrupt and irreversible climate change, respectively. How abrupt? The most abrupt in planetary history. That means the meteor that struck the planet about 66 million years ago and drove the dinosaurs to extinction? That didn't drive as fast a rate of environmental change as we're driving right now. I think that's pretty good evidence to say that climate change is happening. So, like, would you say that the opposing evidence is is much less than the than the the evidence that would suggest that it is happening? Like, is it is there much more of that than the opposing evidence? Oh yeah, the the, the opposing evidence is essentially non-existent, and it's 
it's made up and based on ludicrous ideas. And nobody, nobody has actually tested experimentally the supporting view for climate change being a non-issue. So, yeah, it doesn't even really make sense to include those ideas in your argument, I guess, because they don't they don't experiment in the ways that are well, they, legit, legitimate or you can't. There's no way to experiment. You know, the, the, the common approach is to turn to things like greenhouses. You pump greenhouses full of carbon dioxide to overcome that constraint on plant growth. The next step to say, therefore, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere makes for more plant growth and therefore grows more food so that we can support, you know, 92 billion people on the planet. <laughs> that's <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, but that's the route. That's the way that people go. The other way is there have always been changes. Yes, the planet has experienced higher levels of CO2 than we have now and it has experienced lower co2 than the earth has now but that doesn't mean that all is fine when we get up to 500 or 600 or 800 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right. just because it's happened before doesn't mean it's a good thing you know what else has happened before volcanoes all over the world have blown have blown up and have caused a blackout of the sun and caused the extinction of many species. Uh, that's not fun. That has happened before. That doesn't mean it's normal or natural or a good thing. Right? Mm -hmm. And, well, those are more, probably more, um, those aren't as artificial as what we're doing. I, I think Brian Cox used the word uh, rapid pulse, like we're doing a rapid pulse emission. Like a, right. So it's like vol volcanoes going off one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, like, so that's what we're doing to the atmosphere. It's not like one goes off every hundred thousand years or whatever. Right. We just, <laughs> we just keep, we just keep doing the same thing. Um, and expect that it's not going to be harmful. Yeah. Einstein, um, Einstein had something to say about that, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different response. <laughs> right. Yeah. Insanity. Right? <laughs> right. I think is what he said. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, wh why do you think people fight for self-defeating ideas? What, what, it, what's your take on that? <clears throat> I think there's a couple of reasons. Nobody really likes change. You know, I was making fun a little earlier when I said change is bad, but for a lot of people, change is bad because their lives are great right now. So why would we want anything to change? I'm making lots of money. I'm enjoying my life. Things are going well. This is good. This is all good. This has to be good because my life is going great. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing. <laughs> also, there's a lot of a uh, there's a lot of a, a positive attention to be gained by pointing out the contrary view. Right? No matter what issue we're talking about, there are some people who will always claim the opposite. Whether there's any evidence to support that notion or not. Some people are just going to go down that road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just a attention seeking. I don't know. Yeah, there's a variety of possibilities, I guess. And um, like as, as a psychologist, I always thought it was people do what feels good to them. So yeah, I mean, if their life feels good right now in this paradigm and this certain set of circumstances, then they'll fight for it. <clears throat> and they'll downplay any downside or any counter argument as being wrong irrational or insane um, right um but i mean i gotta tell you like we're here hitting here and coming to the end of november it's uh we're having a very very mild winter this year it's plus uh, yesterday we got up to 13 c i think and that's wow. pretty pretty bizarre in alberta um so i mean and you mentioned that that uh, that concert venue with Taylor Swift that that's pretty extreme temps. Um, Absolutely, the fifty eight C. You know, and, I, I've just I've just been thinking like, don't we need some moisture during the winter if we're going to avoid? We had we had some wildfire problems this last summer, pretty bad. Right. And right. I was close. I was in the I was in the vicinity of a bad one, and I just lucked out. So 
you know, I know. now I'm worried about next summer. You, your Canadian smoke was blocking the sky here in Oakland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a pain pain in your butts down there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we yeah, we can make a lot of that. And I suspect, yeah, next year it's just going to be even, even worse uh, because this well, is the pattern we're in. Right. Although, you know, it could be the next year the fires are all in Australia instead of Canada. Yeah, well, I think we get them every year, but yeah, maybe they're worse. In oh, of places, course, right? Yeah, of course, there will be fires in Canada. That's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah, there will yeah. be fires in Northern Ireland. Or, yeah, you have, of course, yeah, catastrophes, and uh, or where where does the media focus their attention for which ones? I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Huh. So yeah, and then you get to the point of where you know you have the conversation where most of society is stuck in a certain set of patterns and beliefs um, and there is no way out of it then you have to figure out how to be okay with that reality uh, which is another another amount of emotional work <laughs> right where you're learning how to uh, ex uh, feel learn how to feel sadness learn how to feel uh, some of the fear learn how to feel some of the, uh, I guess, uh, disappointment in humanity. Um, I mean, you can do this without going insane. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And you can do this without, you know, your BPD getting worse. You can, you can still take care of yourself dis despite these extreme, uh, dis dis these extreme um, wayward, <laughs> extreme wayward ways of humans. I think Gabor Mate said it very well. He was referring to mm, hospice, or um, but it, but it applies also to pretty much every aspect of reality in your life. He said, accepting inevitability. We have mm -hmm. to accept what is inevitable, the things that are going on. There are going to be more big fires in Canada. That's inevitable. There are going to be more big fires in the West Coast of the United States. There's going to be more big fires in Australia and so on. <laughs> There's going to be monster storms. There's going to be hurricanes, the likes of which we can't even imagine. We have to mm -hmm. accept that. Not yes. accepting that is denial. And complicity. Of course. That is that same, I guess that's a synonym, hey, for denial in a way. Right. Yes, uh, pretty much. I don't know. And it's, it's, it's a game of would you rather, right? Would you rather be honest? Would you rather be real? Or would you rather kind of like follow the mainstream and kind of like live and, you know, take the blue pill or whatever? <laughs> right. There's right. A lot of things. There's a lot of things I don't like, but evidence says what's going to happen. Right. Not me, not you. The evidence says what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'd like to wrap this with two things. Please mention your band. Okay. And please mention your course and where we can find it in either order. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the course is at freebpdcourse.com. I wanted to send out a special thank you to uh, people who have sent um, a couple of donations my way. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of uh, hard work did go into that, producing that that course, and um, it came from. It was it was distilled through painful times, <laughs> I guess. So thank you for those donations. Um, and and we are now up to about sixty five registrations. Last week, uh, several came in, which is uh, just wonderful to see. And um, I'm also open to any feedback or questions that you could have you can you can find me on facebook and uh just send me a direct message if you have a question about and the course is there also a contact page at freebptcourse.com yeah there's an email i have in okay. my bio there's a an, an email icon a gmail icon you can just click on that and send me an email some of some of us are not on facebook okay yeah yeah email always works right so yeah send me an email um, or we could find another way to um, talk about things. I can't say I can't do any therapy with anybody outside of Alberta. That's the only place I'm registered. Uh, but I can answer general questions. Um, 
so thanks for accessing it and i hope and you know and i've i've had um another fellow i i met uh from online he came to visit me and he told me he's sharing it with people in his life and it's nice to hear that's great um and uh, my band is called live avenger uh we got two songs out so far and we got several other on the way for the new year hopefully and uh, several of them will they will definitely reflect the ideas and thoughts that you hear in these talks and some of them in the most punkish angst angsty way <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to point out that Peter pr prepares the video for these. Oh, yeah. Right. So yeah, you, yeah so you find them online and, and you extract information from other videos and from other still shots to yeah. create the videos that go along with them, right? Yeah, it's like a, a music video for each song. I try and produce one. It's it's just, uh, it's, it's amateurish, but it's still fun. <laughs> well, we've been talking for a long time about this idea of having a whole life and doing things that you don't do well, especially if you're a scientist and you're trying to do something in the arts. Kurt Vonnegut pointed this out a thousand times. You know, the the idea of creating something it can only come from you. And it's as a result, it's unique. So I love that idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. What is your work? What is your life work? And um, what did you create? And it's, imp uh, yeah, it's important. I, I think it's important to express that part of us because we are, aren't we inherently creative? Um, as, uh, at, uh, least, at least some of us are. <laughs> <laughs> whether, but, whether you're creating, you know, whatever type of art or whatever type of um, whatever you, whatever you do. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a certain societal pressure to not go outside oh, of the walls that you're trapped. Oh, of course, in, right? no, that's why that's why I love punk because right. I mean all of, all that we do is try and break 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 through those boundaries and um, say you know like screw that we're not going to stay in the box. That's that's the essence of punk. <laughs> right, right. That's why they right. that's why they have green mohawks. <laughs> and so there's a a lot of people watching and listening to the, to this who have been trapped in a box because that's the way the entire society works. And oh, to yeah. break outside of what you specialize in is just not dumb. That's too bad. Uh, I even look at learning like as a type of rebellion. Like if depending on the type of book you're reading, like every page you're learning, you're learning, you're learning. It's like you're you're going, you're not staying. You know, depending on the author you're reading, I guess, right? Like if they're if they're more of a get to the root type of author or more radical. But I mean, I really look at it like I'm just like fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Like I'm like everything I learn, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not staying in the box. I'm learning how to go in the box or out the box or wherever I want to be. Yeah. I, I saw a great meme a couple of days ago. It said, let's make Orwell fiction again. Oh, yeah. yeah, right? yeah. George Orwell of 1984. And you look around and you see, yeah, a lot of what he wrote about in 1948 is happening or at least there's some resemblance to it happening. Well, that's where religions drive me crazy. They're like, just focus on this book and focus on what our authorities say. Just read, 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 listen, listen, listen to whatever they have to say and make it your life lifestyle, right? And like, if you're so focused on the one source, like, how can you be a dynamic thinking person? Like, how do you, how, you can't, right? Like, I, my, my stack of books is up to about 320 and I have this disease where I keep buying books, but I haven't finished them. I, I can't help it, like you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the one of the things I did along the way, a mistake I made when I created the homestead in New Mexico was I accumulated all these books that I was going to read because when the system imploded, I just knew I'd have nothing but time on my hands to read these books. So I left five thousand books behind. Wow, wow. that was painful. <laughs> And I thought 300 books was a lot like, man, you have, you are so, you have read so many books. And I mean, to be a whole human, I think you got to do that. And that's part of the work of uh, not being, not being stuck in the mainstream. You have to, you have to do that. You have to do that um, thinking and reading. Anyway, that's another one of my pitches. So there you go. Okay. So let's wrap it right there. And bear in mind that Peter is offering a, free course in borderline personality disorder you can find it at freebpdcourse.com 
And I look forward to next week when we run this by each other again. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, guys.